this is the 34th message in a series in 1 Corinthians, and we're still in the 7th chapter, and I had hoped to get out of this 7th chapter tonight. I'm not sure whether I'll ever get out of it. I'm like that fellow that somebody asked him why he preached so long, and he said, to tell you the truth, I had John on the Isle of Patmos, and I couldn't get him off. So I think I've been on the Isle of Patmos in 1 Corinthians 7. I've only been there one message, but it seems to me like I've been there forever because I've been thinking about it for so many weeks. And our message tonight is at verse 10 of the seventh chapter, and I'd just like to read to you because it won't be possible to go back over each of these verses and read them. There are five main divisions in the remainder of this chapter, and if you haven't been with us in this series of messages, I'll just have to explain to you briefly that the first Corinthian epistle was written by the Apostle Paul to the Corinthian church. He not only sets forth some truth that he wanted them to know, but he also answers systematically some questions that they asked of him. <coughs> One of the major questions that the Corinthians were having great disturbance about in the assembly was the many facet question of marriage. There were many, many different questions in regard to marriage relationship that they did not understand as Christians. Too lengthy to go in again to the background of the Corinthian church, but they had recently been saved out of paganism. They had no New Testament like we have. They didn't have a book they could go to and say, what does the Word of God say about it? They were dependent upon the prophets and the apostles of that time. So the Apostle Paul was the father of that church. It was through his ministry that they had come to know the Lord Jesus. So they wrote to him about the questions that troubled them. Now the assembly was torn by division and strife. And if you're alert as you study the book of 1 Corinthians, you will learn systematically some of the causes of division in the assembly. For instance, supposing we didn't have any New Testament tonight, and supposing there began to be a great discussion sweeping the assembly on the subject of the marriage relationship, supposing in the assembly were some who had been married and divorced and remarried, supposing there were some who were single and wondered whether it was right to be married or not, supposing there were some who were married and wondered if it was all right to get a divorce, Supposing there were some who were teaching that it was wrong for Christians to be married at all, and others were, were teaching that it was all right to be married, but it was wrong for them to engage in the marriage relationship. And supposing all of these questions began to be common topic of conversation in the assembly, and everyone was going around giving their opinion and offering advice in all of these very delicate, very personal, and very intimate questions. What do you suppose would happen before long in the assembly? Well, there would be a little group that would say, we're of this opinion and we don't want anything to do with the rest of you. And there would be another little group who would say, we're of this opinion and we don't want to do with the rest of you. And this is precisely what had happened in the church. They were just torn all different ways. And there was so much envy and strife and argument and debate among them over these things that apparently they came by mutual consent to the conclusion they should write to Paul and say, look, give us a definite, clear, direct answer, and whatever you say, we'll abide by it. So Paul has this very unpleasant task, I count it, of meeting these intimate, personal questions head on and giving what the Lord has given to him on the subject. Now he touches on this great theme of the marriage relationship among Christians. His advice is not for the unsaved, it is for the Christian. First, he deals, as we did Sunday morning, with the great question of whether or not marriage is right in the sight of God for Christians. He concludes it is. Marriage is honorable in all, he teaches, and the bed is undefiled. The marriage relationship is both right and moral and good and clean, and God approves it, and God blesses it. Now, at verse 10, he touches on some of the other questions in regards to marriage. One of them was, 
supposing a Christian were married to an unchristian person, supposing one member of the marriage, rela uh, marriage uh, contract is a Christian and the other person is not, what then shall we do? Shall we get a divorce or shall we continue to live that way? That was one question that was bothering now listen to what he says, verse 10. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. But and if she depart, and the Greek simply says, if it's already happened, if she's already departed, if she's already left him, let her remain, how? How? Unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife, and to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. And what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband, or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife. Now this is the first division. I'm going to stop there so you don't get confused because we go into another subject at verse 17. The first subject then in regards to marriage, what about a mixed marriage? First of all, let me repeat what you will be hearing further on in this epistle. God forbids an unequal yoke among his people. I'm not going to prove this nor preach on it tonight but simply to remind you that it is never the will of God for a Christian to marry a person who is not a Christian. It is never the will of God for a saved person to enter into marriage with an unsaved person. Two who are not agreed cannot walk together. How can one, Paul argues, have communion with God and the other have communion with Satan and the result be harmony? How can one be in fellowship with the Lord Jesus and one in fellowship with demons and there be unity? How can one love the Lord Jesus and how can the other be a hater of the Lord Jesus in their hearts and there be any mutual agreement in their home or in their marriage relationship? Now, I'm frank to tell you that I don't understand any Christian person who would want to marry an unchristian person. It's hard for me to understand how any believer could have any interest whatever in any person as far as marriage was concerned who did not love our Lord Jesus Christ. A Christian is one who is in love with Jesus. And when you're in love with someone and as you love Jesus, you are supposed to love him supremely. If you're a Christian at all, he holds the highest part of your heart and he claims the highest affection of your heart. And if that be so, how could you possibly think of entering into marriage for life with one who does not share that love in that same Lord Jesus? First of all, if a believer walked in the Spirit at all, he would have nothing whatever in common with an unbeliever. And secondly, I'm surprised and I'm puzzled over any Christian whose life is in such disorder that the unsaved are attracted to them in a physical sense in regards to marriage. I never did find any unsaved men who were attracted to Christ-like girls. And I have never seen any unsaved girls who were interested in Christ-like boys. 
And so it seems, as it is taught in the Scriptures, to be something absolutely ridiculous at the very thought of it, that a believer should want to enter into a life contract with an unsaved person. Paul forbids it, God forbids it, the Holy Spirit forbids it, and for any Christian to sin against that life in marrying an unbeliever, they are asking for heartache, trouble, and terrible chastisement, which surely must come into their lives as a result of disobedience and sin. Now, that is the first thing you must learn about marriage. However, it is true that there are many mixed marriages that were not caused by disobedience, not caused by sin, but caused because of the way the circumstances of their lives unfold. It so happened that way in my life. For when I became a Christian, my wife was not a Christian. So for a short period of time, we had a mixed marriage. It happens this way in many marriages are joined together in marriage, later on one of them gets saved. Then there is a mixed marriage. Then there is the marriage which it exists of a believer and an unbeliever. And this was what had happened in court. Many of these people, their husbands and their wives, were yet unsaved. They had a mixed marriage and the difference was very marked in court. The unsaved party in that marriage was a pagan, idol worshiper, living in awful darkness and sin, making fun of the Christian God, making fun of the Christian Savior. And here was the other in love with Jesus, washed in the precious blood of the Lamb, in fellowship with God, and seeing now their unsaved partner is lost and in darkness and on their way to a Christless eternity and great friction in their home, great difficulty and great trouble in their marriage relationship. Some of the well-meaning Corinthian Christians had given this advice. You know God doesn't want you to live that way. You ought to divorce them. You ought to just walk out and leave them. God doesn't want you to continue on with this unsaved person now that you've become a Christian. And so they write to Paul and say, what shall we do? What shall we do? If one of us is saved and the other is unsaved, should we get a divorce? That's still a question being asked. I had a letter just recently from, to, from up in northern Ohio, and a man asking me to give him Bible answers because of such a situation in his marriage. What should I do? What shall I do? Here is Paul's answer. Listen carefully. He says, I command, verse 10, not I, but the Lord. Notice now, this is the Lord's commandment. This is what the Lord Jesus says, that the wife, if she be the saved one, she is not to depart from her husband. If the man is the saved one, he is not to put away, that is, to divorce his wife. As long as one thing is present, if that unsaved party and that saved party consent mutually to live together, if the unsaved party desires to continue on in marriage, continues to make a home and wants to make a home, Paul says, I command you by the command of the Lord, you cannot leave that person. You must not divorce that one. You must not break up that marriage. And if you have already left them, before you get this letter, if you who are saved have left your wives or divorced your wives or left your husbands over this issue, then hear this, and I want to make this plain. It is the command of the Lord Jesus. You must remain unmarried or be reconciled to your husband or to your wife. And I believe with all my heart that what God really wants 
is that you be reconciled. For God is more interested in the salvation of that person than he is in the salvation of your marriage. He cannot save your marriage unless he saves that one. And he's primarily interested in the salvation of that person's soul. And I think, as I study this chapter, and I confess, this is a very, very difficult chapter. There are many things obscure, yet there are many things plain, and this is one of them. That if you leave an unsaved member or party in marriage, before you learn this truth, that you are not to leave them. You hear me? You understand? Paul says, don't leave. But if you've already left, and if before you learn the truth of 1 Corinthians 7, you've already departed from an unsaved husband or wife, then hear the command of the Lord, you must remain unmarried, or else you must be reconciled to your husband or to your wife. Now, I'd like to say it here because I probably won't get a chance to say it anymore for a long time. We don't touch on it too often. There is no such thing in the New Testament as remarriage for a believer. That is, as long as their husband or their wife liveth. There is no such thing as remarriage. If you'll look at verse 39 of this chapter, you'll hear Paul say, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only out in the Lord. This then simply teaches that if a Christian woman's husband is dead, she is at liberty to remarry. But with this restriction, she must marry in the Lord, not simply a Christian, although that's primarily what it means, she must marry a Christian in the Lord, but it also means in the will of the Lord. only as the Lord gives her liberty and gives to her a Christian husband should she remarry. If a Christian man's wife is dead, he is at liberty to marry again, but he must marry again in the Lord, in the will of the Lord, and to someone who is in the Lord Jesus Christ as he is in the Lord Jesus Christ. God's not the author of confusion. And one of the greatest examples of confusion in the world is an unsaved man or woman joined in marriage to a saved man or woman. Confusion with a capital K. And God will never author any such arrangement. And he forbids remarriage for his people as long as the other party is living because marriage is for all time. And marriage cannot be broken. It may be broken formally by separation, which is the word divorce. But it cannot be broken in the eyes of God. Jesus said something about marriage in the 10th chapter of Mark. He said, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. No man can undo what God has done in marriage, and he will not permit it to be undone. He made them male and female in the beginning. He made them to be joined together so that two were made one. And though you may be divorced or separated and live a thousand miles from the other member of that marriage, you are just as married to that person as though you were living together, sleeping in the same bed, and living in the same house. Now I'm going to read what God's Word says about remarriage, about no remarriage, so that you can, uh, will be able to say that you heard it from the Scriptures. In the 10th chapter of Mark, I know you have a lot of questions, just hold on to them for a minute. We're getting to them. Just have to answer them one at a time. 
I, I know already some of the questions that are raised in your mind. Listen at verse 1 of the 10th chapter of Mark. Verse 2, And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? Tempting him. That is, they were tempting him with such a question, hoping that he would say yes. Yeah. Then they could accuse him. And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? I like that. Plain words, he said, You're a bunch of Bible readers. You're supposed to be so smart. What does the Bible say about it? And they said, Well, Moses said it was all right to give a bill of divorcement, and it was all right to put her away. Jesus answered and said unto them, Listen, for the hardness of your heart he wrote you this precept. He wrote it. God didn't write it. God's decree was, Let not man put asunder what God has wrought. But Moses, because of the hardness of the people's hearts, who would not accept that, who wanted divorce, he said, well, it's all right then for certain causes. And Jesus said, for the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain but one flesh. And what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And in the house his disciples asked him again of the same manner. In other words, they said, Lord, what does that really mean? Give us a little clearer insight into this thing. What did you really mean to say out there to the Pharisees about marriage? And this is what he said. He said, I meant to say that whosoever divorces his wife and marries again commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits what? Adultery. Now, do you think that there's anything not plain about that? Isn't that just about as plain as anything you could read in the Word of God? Now, if you'll look in the seventh chapter of Romans and hear what Paul says at verse 1. And I have to read this correctly because... He keeps referring to the law, and it sounds like he's referring to the law of Moses, but it isn't the law of Moses he's writing to Romans about. It is the principle of law as such, per se. So it should read like this, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know law, how that law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. That's surely true. As long as you live, you have to live by the law. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called what? An adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So here it is again, as plain as ever could be. The marriage contract that involves a believer is forever. Your husband or your wife may be unsaved, but you are bound in the eyes of God to that person until they die. And as long as they live, if you marry another, or if they marry another, you are guilty of adultery. Now, let's go on to another progression here. What if that unsaved person doesn't want to live anymore with that believer? Supposing some Christian woman had an unsaved husband, and he says to her, look, I'm tired of all this business about Jesus. Listen to all this stuff about religion. I don't want to hear it anymore. Either you stop going and listening about Jesus and talking about Jesus, or else I'm just going to pack up and leave. That's what I'm going to do. Or supposing a Christian man had an unsaved wife who said, Look, I'm getting tired of your religion. Now, you either keep still about your religion or I'm going to pack up and go back to Mother or wherever it is she came from. 
What is the Christian supposed to do? Is he supposed to say, all right, to save my marriage, I will never go to the assembly again. To save my marriage, I'll never read the Bible again. To save my marriage, I'll never mention Jesus' name again to you. To save my marriage, you will never hear me pray in this house or ever hear me mention anything that pertains to the Lord. No, sir. Paul says, if that's the situation, let him depart. You know why? Of course you know why. Because your obligation is to Jesus first, your marriage second. Now, you knew that before you ever learned it from the Bible because your heart told you that that was so. And I know today that if my wife were unsaved, much as I love my wife, if she said to me, look, it's either our marriage or else your ministry must go, one or the other, you know what you would be. I would have to say, look, if you don't want to live with me as I am, if you cannot accept me as I am, I cannot, I cannot turn away from Jesus. But we sing about it. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though no one joined me, still I must follow. No turning back. No turning back. And Paul says, if that unbelieving person say, I will leave you, then let them depart. Doesn't say divorce them. It just says let them go. Let them do whatever it is they want to do. You are under no bondage. You cannot be brought into the slavery of such a proposition as a believer, for God has called you, he teaches here, to peace. What's that mean? Paul says in the book of Romans, we are to live with peace, in peace, with all men as far as possible. If it be possible, we are to live in peace with all men. But with an unequal yoke in marriage, it may come to a place where it is impossible to live in peace. And if it becomes impossible to live in peace, and the unbeliever desire to leave, Paul says, let them leave. But as long as that unbeliever desires to stay, you are to stay with them. You cannot put away your wife, if it be that way, and you cannot divorce your husband, if it be the other way. You must stay. God has called you to peace. But if they say, I'm going to leave you, if you don't quit this religion, you have to let them go. You have to let them go. And then he goes on to say, as though you would object and say to that, but, but if I can hold on to my marriage, they might get saved. And his answer, how do you know, O oh woman, whether you will save your husband? How do you know, O oh man, whether you will save your wife? These are circumstances you didn't make. Just let it be as it is. Leave it right where it is. If the unbeliever want to leave, let the unbeliever leave. But if you will notice in this teaching, now I'm trying to make this very clear, the thought runs deep in all that Paul says, that God's most desirable will is that that unequal marriage stay together. You believe that? Stay together. So he says, don't leave them. Don't divorce them. If it comes to an impasse, and the unbelievers say, I'm going to leave, you'll have to let them. But strive to make it work. Strive to make it work. Why? And I'm so glad that I can tell you this tonight, because if you're in these circumstances, this ought to comfort your heart. I just learned this, and, I, and that's the reason I've never emphasized it before, but I will tonight. 
There was some teaching going around in Corinth, obviously, from what Paul writes here, that went like this. If you're a Christian woman or man, I say I have to keep turning around because it works both ways. If you're a Christian and your wife or your husband is unsaved, your children are unclean. They're nothing but the fruit of fornication. And you're living in an unclean relationship. And the marriage relationship between you and that unsaved person is nothing but fornication. And you're in a dirty, filthy relationship with an unsaved person, and you better just get out of it while you can. That's what they were teaching. And I thank God for this. Paul says that isn't so. That if you are married to an unsaved person due to circumstances beyond your control, that unsaved person is sanctified because of your salvation. The word sanctified means to set apart in a special relationship to God. And Paul teaches that that unsaved husband or that unsaved wife, God looks upon them as being in a special relationship to himself. So much so that he regards your children born of that union as clean and holy in his eyes as the children born of two believers. And that ought to be a comfort to any person who's a party in a mixed marriage. God not only recognizes your marriage, he approves of it because there isn't anything you can do about it until such time as he saves your husband or wife. And until that time, he wants you to make that marriage work and he will hold that unsaved member in a special relationship to himself. Look upon your children as holy and clean and give you every encouragement to what shall I say, hang on and hold out and wait until such time as God changes the circumstances of your life. And then he goes on in this chapter to teach, stay in the calling that you were in when the Lord called you. Were you circumcised? Don't try to get uncircumcised. You say that's impossible. You're wrong about that. They had even invented an operation, a surgical operation, where a circumcised person could become uncircumcised again. And it's too lengthy a story to go into. But some of the Jews later became ashamed that they were circumcised because it marked them wherever they went as Jews. And they had operations performed and became uncircumcised again so they could pass as Gentiles. Isn't that something? And it was happening in court. Paul says, are you circumcised? Don't try to be uncircumcised. Were you uncircumcised when the Lord saved you? And don't run out and get circumcised and think that will add anything to you. Were you a servant when the Lord saved you? Don't try to get free. Were you free? Don't become a servant. Let every man abide in the calling wherein he was called. You were bought with a price. You're the Lord's servant, and you belong to him. Now, did you create this situation in your marriage? No. The Lord saved you, and you ended up with an unequal yoke in your marriage, didn't you? All right. Don't seek to change it. God knows about your circumstances. He called you knowing that calling you to his blessed son would create these circumstances. He recognizes your marriage. He sanctifies your husband or your wife. And he holds your children as clean and holy in his eyes. Say, so what does it mean the unbelieving member is sanctified by the salvation of the believer? Does it mean he's saved? No. It means that he's set apart in a special relationship. Now, I'll use Bob Fuller for an example. I won't embarrass him. Now, you see, before he married Beth, he was just one of many boys from Word County. 
He was nothing special to me. If I'd gone out to Work County and met him with a hundred other boys, he would have been no different to me than the other 99. But when he married my daughter, he became something special to me. Did he not? He was set apart from all of those boys in that county in a special relationship to me. I hold him in a special place in my heart. Why? Why, because the happiness of my daughter is tied up with him. And I cannot be happy unless my daughter is happy. Therefore, my ultimate happiness is tied up with him. Does that not make me to look upon him in a little different manner in which I look upon other young men from Ward County? Would I not do for him what I would not do for the other boys in Ward, Ward County? Would I not be inclined to help him, to be kind to him, to minister to him in a way that I would not be so apt in others' lives? Of course. He is sanctified in my eyes. He is set aside in a special relationship to me. And so is the unbelieving member of an unequal yoked marriage. If the Lord saves you and your husband is unsaved, that unsaved husband, if you'll pardon me for using such an expression, becomes a son-in-law to the Lord. Not a true son, but a son-in-law. In a special relationship to him, for your happiness is tied up with him. And the Lord's ultimate joy is tied up with him also. Is he in a special relationship? Oh, my. Think of an unsaved husband living 24 hours a day with a saved woman in contact with the Holy Spirit, someone to pray for, someone to love him in the love of Christ, someone to minister to him in the love of Jesus, someone to long for his salvation like no one else will ever long for his salvation. In a place where he can hear the word of God if he wants to hear it. Where he can learn about Jesus if he wants to learn about Jesus. He is of all unsaved men most privileged, does he not? Think of the unsaved men who never have anyone to pray for them, to speak to them about Jesus or to love them in the love of Christ. Here's an unsaved man living with a saved woman with opportunity every day if that woman will walk in the Spirit to see Jesus in her life, to witness the love of Christ in her until it have an effect on him and convict him and bring him to a knowledge of Christ. And I'll tell you this, if you're a party to an unequal yoke in marriage tonight, God knows about your circumstances. He knows the difficulties that you experience. He knows the special trial, the special tribulations that you go through. But believe you me, if and when God saves that unsaved party, you will know marriage as you've never known it before. And you will know a home that you have never known before. And that unsaved person will love you more than he could have ever loved you otherwise. For he will see now that what he did against Jesus or against you, he was doing against the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll need to be ashamed or to feel that your marriage is unclean in the sight of God. God sanctifies that unsaved person. Your children are clean. They are holy. And God is looking with favor upon that unsaved person, longing for his salvation. He will work through you in every possible way if you will let him. He will use you if you will permit him. He is God's special concern. And I don't know, that isn't my circumstance tonight, but that blessed my heart today when I learned that. For if I were in those circumstances, this would be the greatest message I've heard all year. 
you would take a burden off of my heart. Because I know that a person in an unequal marriage must feel frustrated. And they must feel like they're, they're in a bad situation and a wrong situation that they have to get out of and should get out of. And maybe they feel that that other believers would look down upon them in that circumstance. Well, I assure you tonight, God doesn't look down upon them. God holds that unsaved person in a holy relationship to himself. And God holds those children clean and holy in his eyes. And God honors your marriage. And God will enable you to honor that marriage, too, if you will give yourself to him. Now, I'm going to close with verses 17 through 24. You say, well, you'll never get done. Well, <laughs> that's eight verses. But I will get done because all these eight verses just teach one simple truth. And it's a precious, precious truth. As God has distributed to every man... As the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all the churches. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God, and what he's simply saying is but the doing of the will of God in this regard. Let every man abide in the same calling wherewith, or wherein, rather, he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it, but if thou mayest be free, use it, rather. He that is called in the, or free in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise also he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. This is Paul's answer to those in Corinth who would say, well, if you're a member of an unequal yoke marriage, you should seek to change it. You would leave the household or divorce that party or break up that marriage and change these circumstances. And here is, in essence, is all that Paul teaches in verses 17 through that 24th verse. We cannot and we must not seek to change the circumstances of our life wherein we find ourselves when the Lord saves us. If there's any change to be made in the circumstance of our lives, God will make it. It is foolish and wrong to go back and try to unravel the past and change the past. And I'm so glad this part is here because I know some very precious brothers and sisters in the Lord who have marriages in their past, who have divorced their first wives or second wives and married again, and then the Lord saved them. And then some very spiritual brother came along and said to him, Look here, huh, you're a Christian now. You're going to have to divorce your wife and go back to your first wife. Or you're going to live in adultery all the rest of your life. Did you know that that's taught in many, many Christian churches in this country? Did you know that? Do you know that that's a very, very prominent doctrine in the religious world today? That when a person gets saved, he should go back and undo all of his past as best he can. They even coined a name for it. They call it the doctrine of restitution. If you've stolen anything, you take it back. If you've been married before, you must break up your home. Explain it best you can to your children. Look, kids, <laughs> sorry about that. But this woman uh, is my second wife, and I'm sorry, she may be your mother, but I'll just have to go back to her first wife. I don't love her, and she's married to somebody else, and she's going to have to get divorced too, and we'll have to go back together again, and neither one of us love each other, but we'll be living right then. Isn't that ridiculous? Isn't that silly? Here is the word and the commandment of the Lord Jesus. God takes up your cause and your case just where he finds you when he saves you. As far as he is concerned, you never had another wife. You never had another husband. You never had a past. And you never had a beginning. 
because you remember that the Passover was the beginning of a new year for Israel. And the cross and the cross of Calvary is the beginning of a new life for the believer. And the old life is gone and wiped out and washed away in the precious blood of Christ. And I, for one, am glad, very glad. How, oh how, could we ever go back over those crooked paths and make them straight again? Impossible. How were you when the Lord saved you? Were you married? That's the way God sees you. How were you when God saved you? Were you single? That's how God sees you. Don't seek to change any of that, thinking that to change it will make you any more right with God. We are right with God by the blood of the Lamb. And the past is finished and over with. If you're a servant, don't fret over it. If God wants you to be free, he'll set you free. Are you free? Don't worry about becoming a servant. If he wants you to be a servant, he'll work those circumstances in your life. Are you unmarried? If he wants you to be married, he'll lead you to that person who should be your husband or wife. <coughs> I know a brother in the Lord who, had, there was a previous marriage in the background of he and his wife, and he got saved, and she got saved, and they loved each other, and some Christian men took it upon themselves to come and exhort him, and tell him that he would never be of any use to the Lord until he divorced his wife. He went back to his first wife and heard her first husband and made things right in the sight of God and man or else he'd be no use in the eyes of the Lord. <coughs> and he spoke to me about it. And he said, surely God wouldn't be the author of anything like that. To leave my children without a mother and father and without a home. And I had the joy of showing him this passage of Scripture and saying, brother, when the Lord saved you, as far as he was concerned, you didn't exist until he saw you in Jesus at the cross. He says, your sins and your iniquities will I remember no more against you. And all of that, including your marriages and your divorces or whatever they were, just a part of the sins and the iniquities and the transgressions that he laid upon Jesus at the cross of Calvary. And they're all gone. He's taken them to hell. Thank you. And he's buried them in the deep, and they will never be remembered against you again. How did he find you when he saved you? He found you in happy marriage. Stay right there. That woman is your wife in his eyes, and those children are your children, recognized by him as clean and holy. And that marriage is the only marriage, as far as God is concerned, you ever had. The only life you ever had is the life you now have in the Lord Jesus Christ. That ought to bring special joy to many of God's people to know that we aren't expected to go back and unravel or change our lives. Too much has gone in the way of water over the dam. We were bought with a price. What was that price? The blood of Jesus. We are his. Don't be the servants of men. You know what that means? Don't let every Tom, Dick, and Harry that comes down the pike try to straighten your life out. Serve Jesus. Say, Jesus bought me with his blood. I am his. I am his to answer to. I don't have to answer to any man about anything in my life. And I'm so glad that it's just that way. Because I want to tell you, if you tried to walk to please men, you'd be crazy in 30 days. Every man that come along would have a different idea of how you should walk to be pleasing to the Lord. Here's how to walk to be pleasing to the Lord. Remember this. Jesus bought you. You are his. Care for nothing but the smile of his holy face. And remember that he took up your cause just where he found you in this life. 
in whatever circumstances you were in, he found you in them and saved you in them and knows about them. And if he wants them changed, he'll change them. If there's anything in your life that needs to be unraveled, he'll unravel it. If there's anything in your life that needs to be reversed, he'll reverse it. You're his, bought with his precious blood. Abide in the same calling wherein you were called. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for thy word and for this message tonight. Make it a special blessing to someone here and to those who will hear this tape all over the United States. We pray that someone's heart will be blessed and their lives will be changed and the burden will be lifted from their hearts. Thank you, Father, that Calvary covers it all and that we are just what we are by the grace of God and that you accept us just as we are without one plea, but that your blood was shed for me and that you bid me come to you. And, O Lamb of God, I came, and these have come, and we are yours. Help us to keep our eye on Jesus and walk pleasing to him. In his precious name we pray. Amen.